Hey everyone, thanks for coming. Welcome to our Airflow Summit Talk. Let's do some quick introductions before we get things started. Hey, I'm Megan. I'm a woman with blonde hair, wearing a green Shopify hoodie, sitting in my home office. And I'm Sam. I'm a man with a mustache and a black baseball hat, wearing a green Shopify hoodie and sitting in my home office. We work on the Data Foundation team at Shopify, where we maintain the Airflow infrastructure, support Shopify Airflow developers, and contribute back to the Airflow community. Hey, Sam, what would you say are the driving factors for our talk today? Good thing you asked, Megan. Here at Shopify, we have a small team developing and maintaining Airflow amongst many other responsibilities, and we support hundreds of users running over 10,000 jobs. Our Airflow users at Shopify rightfully expect a reliable environment where they can run their DAGs with low latency in production and iterate on jobs quickly in staging. This means that our infrastructure team must prioritize adding features to Airflow that provide the maximum benefit to our users so they can have access to an environment that they're happy to use. Today, we're gonna to discuss the ways that we can reduce operational overhead while meeting our users' needs and providing an effective user experience. That sounds exciting. We can start by giving an overview of Airflow at Shopify, then we'll talk about Airflow reliability, followed by Airflow user experience. We will conclude with a discussion on what's next for Airflow at Shopify. Awesome. Cool, so how do we use Airflow at Shopify? Airflow adoption at Shopify has expanded dramatically over the last few years. We currently have over 10,000 DAGs running in our production environment with over 7 million tasks running every month. Even with these volumes, we maintain a three seconds task start latency. That's a lot accomplished with such a small group of people. It really is. We have so many different use cases running on Airflow, including data ingestion, DBT modeling, machine learning model training, Apache iceberg table maintenance, data retention jobs, as well as various aggregations and loads. Wow, that's an extremely diverse set of use cases. How did we get to that point? It's taken us about three years to get to this point. In 2019, we started thinking about moving to a unified scheduler. At that time, we were using Uzi, Azkaban, as well as some single team Airflow instances. The decision was made to move towards a unified scheduler to simplify the support model and reduce the overhead in maintaining multiple schedulers. In 2020, we started the migration process. In 2021, we upgraded to Airflow 2.0 and completed the migration and deprecation of Azkaban. In 2022, we plan to compete, complete the Uzi migration and we're well on our way to achieving that goal. That's an exciting journey with Airflow. Can you describe the current state of our Airflow infrastructure? For sure. This slide shows our Airflow architecture at Shopify. We're currently running Airflow on Google Kubernetes Engine using Cloud SQL and Google Cloud Storage for storing DAGs as well as logs. We're currently supporting three environments, development, staging, and production. More on that later. Since all of our environments run on Kubernetes and are mostly stateless, a lot of the issues that we experience are self-healing, and we can even perform most operations and upgrades in place. Great. Given all that information, I think we're ready to start talking about how we approach Airflow reliability at Shopify. I agree. How would you describe our approach to reliability at Shopify? Reliability is a top priority at Shopify because we run such a large number of DAGs in a single environment. We aim for three nines of uptime, which only allows for eight hours of downtime per year. It's important that we're able to provide a stable environment through Airflow upgrades and are able to handle high throughput times. We can prepare for these scenarios with rigorous testing procedures. Also, we have diverse workloads running in a shared environment. So it's important that we enforce policies and safeguards that ensure users are not able to impact others on the platform. It's awesome that testing and safeguards can lead to better reliability. Can you tell us more about the ways that we test our Airflow jobs as well as infrastructure to ensure that they're reliable? Sure. We perform three types of tests, unit testing, smoke testing, and load testing. Each type of testing serves a different purpose and having all three types provides a comprehensive way of testing the environment. That makes sense. Um, can we hear a little more about unit testing? Definitely. Unit testing is performed by Airflow developers, not the data infrastructure team. Airflow developers unit test their DAGs to ensure that the DAG logic is behaving as expected. This is the basic form of testing at a DAG level. It's important to have good unit tests so we know that a DAG will function properly when changes are made to the logic down the road. Unit testing is really important, sure, but how does that differ from smoke testing? So smoke testing in Airflow was introduced by the data infrastructure team. First, we decided on a list of supported operators that we commit to having working successfully at all times. This list contains Dataproc, Kubernetes, Python, and Slack operators. Then we built a DAG to run each of these operators. 
We can run the smoke testing DAG after major platform changes, such as an airflow upgrade, to ensure that the most commonly used operators are working successfully before we roll those changes out to our users. Right. So now that we've covered DAG lo testing of DAG logic, as well as operator functionality after an upgrade, could you talk a little bit more about load testing? So load testing was also built by our data infrastructure team, and this was initially developed to solve a problem that will probably feel familiar, a lack of data in our development environment. Our development environment is only used by the data infrastructure team to, to test platform changes, and as a result, only has a small number of DAGs that run there. Load testing allows us to generate a large number of DAGs that run on a normal distribution. We also found that the, loading, the load testing setup was useful for testing anticipated loads in our staging environment or for recreating a bug that we found in our production environment in our development environment. Wow, the use cases seem endless. Exactly. Now we can load test our environment at will, and I'm sure there will be many more use cases for this. Absolutely. So how was that implemented? Load testing was implemented as a dynamic DAG, which when enabled generates a user specified number of DAGs to run in a given duration. The number of DAGs and duration can be parameterized through airflow variables. We set the DAGs to execute on a normal distribution to simulate the natural load uh, that ramps up slowly, runs at peak for a few minutes, and then gradually winds down. For example, we can kick off a load test of 1,000 DAGs for 20 minutes, and these 1,000 DAGs will run normally distributed over the 20-minute time period. We also added functionality into our load testing script to randomize the DAG depth to ensure a more realistic test. Cool. So in summary, unit testing covers DAG logic, smoke testing covers operator functionality, and load testing covers the integrity and scalability of the airflow environment itself. That's right. Testing is really important, and it's ultimately the responsibility of both the Airflow developers and the platform engineers to ensure that the Airflow environment is reliable. It can be difficult to discern ownership in a shared environment, so it's important to ensure that there are clear roles and responsibilities defined. Agreed. Can you think of some of the ways that we've ensured Airflow developers don't need to worry about their DAGs being impacted by other workloads? Yeah, we've developed, we've implemented many policies and safeguards to ensure that users can build and run their DAGs without worrying about stepping on toes. Some challenges we've faced with Airflow in a multi-tenant environment that can be addressed with policies and safeguards are project naming conflicts, DAGs consuming too many resources, and DAGs launching Kubernetes pods and other namespaces. Yeah, I can see how any of those issues could lead to a less reliable environment. How have we addressed uh, project naming conflicts? We use namespaces to enforce project isolation. We've created a manifest YAML file where we can define projects and define some simple rules such as pools and queues that a given set of DAGs can use or the Kubernetes clusters that a given set of jobs can launch pods in. Another issue we've solved for is task concurrency. Are you interested in hearing more about that? Definitely. So we also ensure that a DAG can only be run in specified pools to ensure that a single DAG is not able to bring down our airflow environment by running too many tasks. Our manifest YAML file also ensures that a DAG must only on-queue tasks to a specified salary queue and can only launch pods in a provided list of external clusters. That manifest YAML file seems really useful, but how do the rules and constraints here specified here actually get applied to DAGs? DAG policies. We have a DAG policy file that ensures that DAGs that do not conform to our specifications for the environment are not even able to load. This file ensures that the namespaces and pools exist. This way, our platform team is certain that users are not uploading any DAGs that conflict with the DAGs of other users sharing the environment and are not able to consume too many resources with any DAG run. This prevents involvement from the data infrastructure team because projects are isolated within the shared environment. Yeah, I can see how that could be very important for helping to reduce the number of airflow issues that we have to deal with. Exactly. And that's not all. We've made some other changes to our infrastructure and operations to minimize disruptions and alert on failures. Oh, cool. Uh, let's hear more about that. The way we've de designed our environment lends well to ensuring that changes are fully tested before they're implemented. We have three environments, development, staging, and production. We decided to use GKE for all three environments so access is available to external systems in development and staging. Development is only used by the data platform team to test major changes. Once platform changes are verified in development, they're pushed to staging. 
The staging environment is production-like and is used by Airflow developers to build and test DAGs. This environment is also used as a final testing environment for the data platform team before moving to production. The production environment is only used for scheduled jobs and is not for testing purposes. This ensures that we have the best reliability in our production environment and pretty good reliability in our staging environment. We don't have to worry about the reliability of our development environment and this lends well to innovation. Right. So we have an entire Airflow environment exclusively for testing and developing DAGs, but can't you just do that all locally? A remote staging environment offers some serious benefits, but definitely comes with some drawbacks. Every user action is clearly auditable and users don't need to use their own credentials for accessing external sources or worry about importing connections. Additionally, it's really easy to get up and running with Airflow development since there's almost no local setup required. On the flip side, this adds some maintenance overhead for us and creates a single point of failure. Also, syntax highlighting and code completion won't work as well without all of the operators and providers available locally. Fair enough. So maybe this is a design decision which we need to reevaluate every now and then, but it sounds like it's working pretty well for now. So if we do have multiple environments, how do we monitor them and ensure that we're notified if there's any failures? So in all three environments, we have a heartbeat DAG that runs every minute and emits some metrics. This DAG has a high priority and ensures it runs even when the airflow environment is busy. The absence of this DAG will trigger an alert for the data platform team to investigate the outage. We also have a Datadog dashboard that provides metrics to indicate the health of the airflow scheduler and workers. That must make supporting Airflow so much easier because we can easily identify the source of an issue right away. Yeah, we also track some other useful metrics, including task start latency, file parsing performance, the speed of our file synchronization process, and the amount of time that the schedulers are spending in the critical section. Cool. And since we're running so many DAGs, I'm sure we must run into some issues with large amounts of metadata, right? Yeah. We did encounter some issues with the airflow metadata getting too large, leading to performance degradations and extremely long running migrations. We solved this issue by building a DAG which uses ORM queries within a Python operator to delete rows from any tables containing historical data, such as the DAG run or task instance table. We decided to maintain a historical data for 28 days because it gave us sufficient information to track performance and manage issues while keeping the volume of our data under control. That's great. We have so many interesting tools that make Airflow reliable, and these have been some really great considerations. For sure. Well, that's enough about the administrator's experience. What have we done to improve Airflow's accessibility for our users? That's a really good question. So two things that we can touch on today are the use of Git operations for managing Airflow configuration, as well as an opinionated CLI that we've built to make it easier to develop workflows. Tracking the configuration via GitHub, isn't that pretty straightforward? Mm, yes and no. It's one thing to manage your Airflow config in GitHub, but we've also extended our tooling to enable the management of pools, connections, variables, and even users via GitHub. This is done using a combination of tools. eJSON, which is an open source tool created at Shopify for encrypting and decrypting JSON files, the manifest files mentioned earlier, as well as some custom loader scripts that tie it all together. Cool. Let's dig into the implementation of that. All right, so first let's talk about namespace specific objects, specifically connections and variables. Each DAG namespace includes an eJSON file where a user can insert their data, encrypt it, and check it into GitHub right alongside their DAGs. This will get uploaded to the remote environment where a Python script that's stored amongst the DAGs will traverse all of these files, decrypt them, and synchronize their contents with the database every time it's imported. For globally relevant, non-sensitive attributes, such as pools or the list of admin users, we just write these into a config map, which is then mounted into our Airflow containers and written into the Airflow home directory. We then have an Airflow DAG, which will periodically read these files and synchronize the list of admins, as well as the set of pools. Combined, these two tools allow users to make changes to the Airflow environment without requiring admin access or access to the Airflow CLI. This also gives us the benefit of a code review process and a clear audit trail for any changes. This is great because it reduces the volume of support requests us administrators get, and it allows us to keep the admin role restricted to a small group of users who actually need it. Anyways, what were you saying about a command line tool? How is that different from Airflow's built-in CLI? Great question. We built Surf as an opinionated CLI and client library for Airflow, which allows users to interact with the remote Airflow environment from the comfort of their own command line. 
It includes browser-based web authentication flow, which allows it to communicate securely with the Airflow web server and by extension, the Airflow REST API. From there, we've built out a few opinionated commands for doing things like triggering DAGs, pausing groups of DAGs based on a regex of the DAG ID, or even uploading jobs to the staging environment. The staging upload is pretty interesting because uh, we actually had to implement a custom API endpoint, which will pull a file down to the staging environment and then process it on demand. This allows users to get immediate feedback on any errors in their job without having to configure a full local development environment. Additionally, Surf is distributed as a regular Python library, so people can call the functions directly within their own scripts, allowing them to leverage Surf to build their own project-specific dev tooling. Awesome. Why don't we just show what the DAG authoring workflow looks like? Great idea. I actually have a DAG I was working on for Airflow Summit. Maybe we could show that? Sounds great. All right, then. I think that this DAG is complete, and now I just need to run it in the staging environment to ensure that it works as expected. Let's give it a push and see what happens. Uh-oh, that doesn't look good. And I think I've seen that explosion somewhere before. Yeah, this isn't promising, but I think that the included stack trace makes it pretty clear. I guess I just forgot to add the start date. It's an easy mistake, so let's get that fixed up. Okay. I've imported Pendulum and added a start date. This looks a lot better, so I'm gonna rerun the same command. Nice, that looks a lot better. That's a pretty fast confirmation as well. Yep, and now I just need to trigger the job. Um, what's the syntax for that again? It's been a long time since slide 30. It really has. Um, I'm pretty sure it's surf dags triggered followed by the dag ID. Oh, you're right. And it looks like there's only one DAG which fits that description, so I'm going to run it. And here's a link to the web UI for that DAG run. So let's just pull up the logs. Oh, cool, it worked. Well, welcome to Airflow Summit. The possibilities are really endless with Surf. Absolutely. There are also many opportunities for us to contribute back to the open source Airflow community, given all the growth we've experienced. Uh, we've recently made contributions to the Airflow Stable API that have allowed us to expand the functionality of Surf, especially when working with a large number of DAGs. It's so much fun to work on a team where we can contribute back to the open source community. Agreed. The contributions we have made have enabled us to add features, fix issues, and grow our Airflow instance. We are interested in upgrading to Airflow 2.3 in the near future so we can use the latest features. This will help us in achieving our goal of growing our environment to 30,000 DAGs this year. Wow, 30,000 DAGs is a big goal. For sure. We'll probably have to move to multiple production environments and use a Kubernetes executor to reach that goal. We have a lot of exciting initiatives underway in the Airflow space and always have interesting challenges to solve as our platform matures. Our data platform team is always working on adding new features to better support the Airflow developers at Shopify. We do this with a heavy focus on reliability and user experience. Yeah, this chat convinced me that the reliability of the system and the user experience are really important to focus on. I think that we, we should ask ourselves whether each feature we build lends well to either of those areas. That's a great idea. Thank you for all your great ideas today, Sam. We would also like to thank the rest of the Airflow platform team and developers at Shopify for their contributions that improve Airflow and allow us to grow. We would like to extend a huge thank you as well to the Airflow open source community for the features they contribute to make Airflow better. Finally, a special thank you to the Summit organizers for giving us the opportunity to speak today. If you're interested in getting in touch with myself or Sam, feel free to reach out on the official Airflow Slack. Hope to see you there.